us. Uh, what could be at stake for every single one of us to know that the living God is active, is alive, is, a he is here right now, wherever you are, and wanting to do something in your life that hasn't yet happened before? What if that's true, right? I've experienced it. I believe that it is. Some of you coming a little, with a little more doubt or skepticism, and you're in the right place on every campus, but what if that's the case? What if for the first time guests that have been checking out Bridgepoint lately, just, uh, it's an honor to have you and come and see what God is up to in the life of our church family. Uh, wh what if it meant something that the Spirit was at work today? What if, what if at every campus, right now, every heart just paused and considered, what if this is a moment that the Almighty God is trying to speak to me? However I got here, however I tuned into this message today, what if this is a moment that God wants to say something to me? So whether you're tuned in downtown or in Seminole, online, or here in the room at Tyrone, I am so pumped that you're here for this series that we're calling What's Next. Essentially looking at all that we celebrated at Easter just a few weeks ago and asking ourselves, but what do we do with that? And maybe you found yourself in that faith spot a little bit yourself. Like Easter's good, we have great worship moments or you've had some moments in your past, either the not so distant past or a long, long time ago where you knew that this was real and it, it meant something and, and it was beginning a work in you, but maybe now you find yourself more just saying, yeah, but what's next? I'm glad that you're here. This is week two of this message series. Last week, we looked back to the early church. So the very beginning of how Christianity, this movement of, of Jesus followers, they just witnessed the death and resurrection, which obviously shook them up. And then they interacted with Jesus after his resurrection, which obviously shook them up. And now they were in a place where they were saying, the world needs to know who we found and who's found us. And his spirit, his spirit was promised to come. That, that, that God would be with us and, and with them every moment of every day. And that's what's at stake for every single one of us. We left off in, uh, last week with Jesus saying, guys, wait until the Spirit comes. And I'm so thankful that we live on this side of Scripture, both so we have God's Word, the Bible, but also we can look back at the history of it and see that so much of it was confirmed and proven true. Praise the Lord. That God is still alive and still at work in, uh, in the world all around us. So last week, Jesus said, wait, because when the, the presence of God is with you, it's gonna in increase a power inside you to be an outward facing movement because the, the following of Jesus thing, this whole thing was never intended to be a circle of wagons, kumbaya moment. It was intended to be something that says, we've got to take this to the world and the world starts with the neighbor next door. It starts with the person maybe across from your living room or in your classroom or in your workplace that the presence of God would be with you to go and take this message. And so then we're today, we're gonna pick it up in Acts chapter two as we continue looking at what this story of what's next was then and what it might mean for our faith journeys today. So again, last week Jesus said, hang tight, the presence of God is coming, the Holy Spirit is coming, and when he comes, you will be able to live fully into everything that I've promised planned and prepared for you. We're gonna pick it up in Acts chapter two as we see that fulfillment come to fruition entirely. Acts chapter two, starting in verse one, it says this. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they, that's the disciples, the guys that were waiting together, just as Jesus had said, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house while, while, where they were sitting. Now, you also need to know that when the Spirit decides to move, the Spirit's gonna move. And sometimes that means things will get a little bit wild, all right? That's what we're about to read the account of right now, the arrival of the Spirit. It says this in verse three. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. That would have been odd. And it, their response was, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Again, this was a powerful moment. I'm sure when they thought, they, when Jesus said, just hang tight, the Spirit is gonna come, I, th I, I wonder what they thought. I'm betting nobody put the odds on flaming tongues of fire would come down and they'd all start speaking different languages. 
But when God wants to move, God wants to move. And we quickly understand why the Spirit arrived on the scene for the very first time in this way. In verse 5, it says this, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered. I would have been too. Because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. So here you see the Spirit of God doing exactly what Jesus had just promised them that he would do. That guys, here's the call. Here's your purpose. Here's what's next. You will take this movement out into the world that you will be positioned outward looking for people that need to find what you've found. Or more specifically, looking for folks who need to know who you know. And so the very arrival of the Holy Spirit was not so they could huddle up and say, look what power we found, right? The arrival of the Holy Spirit was to fuel them by the presence of God with them always to go, to go and begin to communicate a new way and a new path and new love and new grace to a community that was desperately searching for more than their religiosity had ever found. And that's what we see, that suddenly this ragtag group of disciples, little background on them, most of them were fishermen, tradesmen, hardworking dudes, but very, very like non-scholarly types. You know what I'm saying? And they suddenly walk out of their huddle of waiting for the Spirit to come, and they start speaking in the languages that were present all around them. Enough so that the people that were looking to these disciples, that it, what, what Luke says as he was doing this investigative work and writing the book of Acts, Luke said it caused everybody to be bewildered. That tracks for me. When somebody walks out of a room and it's like, oh yeah, there's fisherman so-and-so, and he starts speaking in a new language, my language, in a way that I can understand him like I never have before, suddenly the presence of God was changing everything for that ragtag group of disciples. Just like Jesus promised. Just like he promised. Look at what it led to, verse 7. It says this, and they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Like it's a really kind way of just being like, since when did those type of folks learn my type of language? Again, that's fisherman so-and-so. That's tax collector so-and-so. When did he get on Babel or Rosetta Stone and start picking up a new language to bring to me? The power of the Holy Spirit. Since when did fishermen learn new languages? Since when? And that's the beauty of this moment. I told you last week, for some of you, what you need to be reminded of is that you, as a follower of Jesus, and this is open access to anyone that placed their trust and faith in Jesus, their promise is to be a presence with you always and forever. And that presence is so that you and I can fully live out our purposes. And sometimes our purpose is gonna be bigger than our ability. It's gonna be bigger than our confidence. It's gonna be bigger than the words that we can say or the thoughts that we could think. And that's the beauty of the presence of God in us is that though sometimes we are weak and aren't we so sometimes, but that's when he is strong. And here's what I wanna remind everybody as we're now on a journey of exploring and understanding what's next for us in our faith by looking back to that original what's next season for the disciples. What's true for us is that there is still to this day not a shortage of the Holy Spirit. He's not suddenly looking in at your life saying, man, I don't know, I don't know what I could do with this one. I don't know how I'm gonna work. I don't know how I can use them. I mean, I, I, maybe the person sitting next to them, but they often are so weak. <laughs> they often seem to lack the answers. It often feels scary to them. And I need you to know that because of the presence of God with you, everything's changed. 
And the only time you and I are experiencing limits in our faith journey is when we put them there. Because the Spirit of God is still as unlimited today as he was back then. And his call and his heart for you, what's next for you, is the same today as it was back then. Take this message that you found, because found people find people, and find people that need to hear it. And then use whatever means possible for you to begin to speak that message into their lives. God is ready. God is waiting to see us trust in his power because he desperately wants to see you and I live in his presence. And that's the Holy Spirit power in us. And we're only in chapter two of Acts as this movement began to spread. But suddenly when the Holy Spirit showed up, the things were beginning to live in just as Jesus said that they were. Everything was changing because suddenly our human limits didn't matter in the kingdom and economy of God. Because suddenly God's purpose and his identity on us became the key thing for the believers back then that were gonna carry this movement forward. And the same is true for us. Now, I want to fast forward a little bit in Acts chapter 2. If you have time this afternoon or sometime this week, I would encourage you to go back to reading it and, and see the specifics of what this looked like. But for the disciples, when they recognized that they were in the presence of the Holy Spirit, they said, all right, go time. Let's take this message. And, and for Peter, he was the one that he just got busy preaching. He got busy preaching, not gathering people with a formal message like we often think of preaching, but just saying, with my life, with my actions, and when necessary, with my words, I'm going to take this movement outward. I'm going to start telling the world. And so he got busy doing his thing. Peter began to preach. And there's something to being able to rely on the Holy Spirit to do his thing in the midst of whatever thing we're trying to do that absolutely changes everything. And that's what Peter began to experience. So again, fast forward with me just a little bit. We're gonna jump all the way down to verse 36. This is Peter in go mode, bringing the message of who he had discovered to a group of people that were far from certain about Jesus. And here's what Peter had to say. Let's take it to his words directly in verse 36. Peter said, let all the house of Israel, therefore, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Let's know for certain. Eyewitnesses are present. You can talk to them. Many of us have hung out with Jesus after he rose from the grave. You need to know what we know, and this matters. He's king. He's the Lord. He's the Christ. And then it says this. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? I love this moment. I, I love the honesty of this moment. I love the gathering of this group of people represented in this moment, that what they were being confronted with, some of them for the first time, or some of them because it was just hard to miss what they'd been experiencing in the past couple months, that this man who claimed to be God and came and, and was loving and living differently, demonstrating power over the earth, over nature, over the human body, over sicknesses, over the power of our inabilities, he was able. And so suddenly all these people were saying it must be true, but then he died. But then he rose and it just changes everything. So everyone was trying to wrap their heads around who is this Jesus? And listen, if, if you're tuned in today and, and this faith thing isn't yours yet, that you're asking questions or, or you just got invited by a friend, I'm so glad that you're here to just process like they did in this original setting 2,000 some odd years ago. Because this is the thing to do. It, I think it's appropriate. I think it's both intellectually necessary, historically worthwhile. And when it comes to your faith, it's worth exploring who Jesus was. And, and all John, all Peter was trying to do in this preach was just say, guys, I've met him and it's changed everything. He's the Lord you're looking to build your life around and he's the king that holds it all together. 
How do I know that? Because all of his claims were backed up. All of his promises held true. And all that was prophesied about him was fulfilled. And today, I just want to invite you to explore about who you say Jesus is. Who is he to you? Who was this man a couple thousand years ago? What's your response to him? What do you think about him? What does it mean to you? Because as these people were beginning to hear what became known, fully known as the truth about this guy, I love, I love how Luke, as he's recording the book of Acts for us, he says they were cut to the heart. And that's the moment where I want to point out that's what God was doing through Peter. Peter got up and shared words, words that I'm confident the Spirit was making land on the human heart. Because you know what us preachers have zero power over? Your heart. And so I I love the moments. And I hear feedback from, from so many of you so often that are so grateful for the way God is at work in these spaces. I hear feedback from so many of you so often that's like, man, your message today was exactly what I needed to hear. And I hear feedback from some of you. It's like, it's like you're reading my my blog. Do people still blog? Like, it's like you're reading my diary. Like, how did you know I had just had that conversation? How did you know that's what was going through? That's what was going through in my life. How did you know what I've been thinking about or processing lately? How did you know those things? And here's a little secret. (laughs) I didn't. I didn't. There's no way I could. Nobody needs to panic. I'm not getting direct access into your diary. That'd be weird for me too, and you know it. But that's the power of God. That when we're willing to just show up, share some of what he said, and share my story about what he's done in my own life, and you can do this too. That's when the Spirit's willing to cut to the heart to speak something deep in there, to have one of those moments. And and some of you remember distinctly sitting in a worship service or a coffee shop, hearing words from a a friend or an experience on a a serve team or, or, or just one of those moments where you know it was when God was meeting with you that something stirred inside that was just different, right? That's what it looks like when God's on the move. That's what it looks like when God's speaking in our hearts. That's what it looks like when God does what only God can do. And so here's a whole crowd of people that are feeling something, stirred with something, hearing the words of Peter and they're they're meaning something. And so their response is like, what do we do with this? (laughs) Because doing nothing isn't an option. Not responding to this isn't an option. I can pretend that it's meaningless. I can pretend to devalue it. I can try to not let this stir something in me, but I've got to do something with this. And for some of you, maybe this is the message that you needed to hear from God today. Because in your faith journey, on every campus, I know there's some of you, because I've heard from you, that, are, that God's doing something in your life right now. And part of our goal is just to figure out what's next. Maybe what Peter said to them is your next step. So don't take it from me. I want you to hear Peter's words. They said, what what do we do? What do we do with what you're saying? Verse 38, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter said, if you're feeling that deep inside and you're asking yourself, what's next? Peter gave it to you. What's next? Repent. In other words, Peter's saying, just turn from life as you've known it and turn towards the beginning of new life as God defines it. It's it's the turn from. It's turning from sin, turning from brokenness, turning from all that's made life as it is for you now and turning towards a space that might be more life-giving than anything we found on our own anyway, right? And here's why I say that it applies to us because getting to hear so many of the stories that are shared on all of our campuses, even online, I know that right now some of you are carrying the weight of sin in your own life that life is heavy, 
that the shame feels overwhelming, paralyzing. I know that many of you are, are weighed down by the anxiousness or fear of what's next or, or what God's doing specifically in some of your own circumstances. I know for some of you, it's, it's scary. It's dark. It feels like it's never gonna end. That there seems like there's no way out sometimes. That it feels like it'd just be worth just stopping and giving up more than trying to keep pressing forward. I know for some of you, you know, the, the weight of the brokenness that's led to this day feels like it defines you so often that you can't escape the labels. You can't escape what people are saying. You can't escape the identity that we've often taken, taken on in our lives that led us to that place where we suddenly were like, this isn't working anymore. I'm broken. I'm hurting I've ruined things. I've been on a path towards destruction and the invitation of Jesus and the move of his spirit is not an invitation that you and I get ourselves cleaned up and then head to church to see if we can find what we're looking for. The invitation is to stop right here in this broken space with all of our sin and all of our shame and just say, God, I am a sinner. I have broken this. It hurts. I've, I've wreaked havoc on my own soul and relationships all around me. And I want to repent, turn from that which has led me to this death and destruction and I want to move towards that which I'm hoping brings me life because God, this hasn't been working and maybe that's the step for you today. It's just to repent. It's, it's to turn. It's to say, man, death and destruction has been my pattern but I won't find new life in dead places so I'm gonna turn towards the God that promised new life in and through me and I wanna be baptized. That's why we talk about that. We got a big baptism day coming up May 19th at the pier where we're gonna join with a few other churches in our community and just celebrate new life in baptism. That's what baptism is. It's that symbol of I'm laying down my old ways. I'm repenting of that life, of that sin to take on new life. It doesn't mean I'm taking on all the answers. It doesn't mean it all makes sense. It doesn't mean I'm suddenly living perfectly as if that was even a thing. It just means I'm turning from those old ways to take on new life in Jesus because there's something in me that's cutting me to the heart. And maybe that's your next step. And I wanna encourage you, if even in this moment right now, your heart is thumping or deep inside you're feeling something or you just need to process it, you're not sitting in a room full of perfect people. You're sitting in a room full of people that were on that path towards destruction and are just doing their best now to head towards the life God has offered. Maybe it's reaching out to the people that are loving on your kids and kids point right now. Maybe it's reaching out to people that are on your serve team or that are helping you find a parking spot. Maybe it's reaching out to a campus pastor or some of our church staff and just saying, I need to talk about this. I cut to the heart and I think it's time for me to take a next step because I'm trying to figure out what's next. Maybe that's yours today. I don't want to dwell on it too long. But guys, the, the message that Peter was giving was the good news of Jesus. And if Jesus isn't good news to you, then please let us remind you of what his message actually was. He's alive and it changes everything about our lives today. Talk to somebody. I wanna keep going in this story because now is one of the most beautiful aspects of this new life that God was birthing in these folks that suddenly faith had a presence to go with it and it was changing everything. And what that change did was it changed the motivations of everyone that was cut to the heart. It changed the motivations of people that were experiencing this. Jump down with me to verse 41 of chapter two. Look what it says. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls. Good night. That's preaching right there. I'm sorry, you guys have to settle. <laughs> Man, just so many people cut to the heart and responding to new life. Can you imagine as we allow the Spirit to do His work in and through our faith family what God might do? 
3,000 souls. And look what it says they did. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Don't miss that part because I think that's the part in our American culture that we often take for granted. As the Spirit was beginning to do a new work in them, they recognized, I've got to be all in on something new about the way I live my life because how I've done it on my own wasn't working. That they said, I've got to be devoted. You get that word? Devotion, like I've got to let devotion define me where they were not saying, I've got to be in church every day of the week. Nobody needs to be in church every day of the week. <laughs> But they said, I've got to be devoted to people that are going to help move me in the same direction that God is moving me right now. It's not good enough for me to continue to try to take this Jesus thing back to my old hangups and hangouts. I've got to experience this Jesus thing and get around people that will continue to fan it into flame for me. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Because the old way wasn't working, a new way must be installed. And as the Spirit did his work and they matched it with a commitment, a devotion to being around people that shared their values and their, their love for God's word, the Bible, to be around people that were not perfect and that not people that had all the answers, but people that were willing to walk with them, to share life with them, but to be together with them. I want you to see what happened. What was the response of those people? Maybe this is what's next for you. Verse 33 says, and awe came upon every soul. Awe. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. That when they began, when they recognized that God was beginning a new faith, a new thing, a new life in them, they said, I've got to be somewhere that's going to help to call that out of me. Because taking it somewhere that won't call it out, but in quite honestly, might stuff it back in, I don't want to settle for that. And suddenly when you find yourself consistently gathering with people that are helping to call out what the Holy Spirit is and wants to do in your life and mine, all happens because suddenly you see miracles all the time. You see movements of God all the time. You see evidences of new life all the time. You see broken marriages restored all the time. You see fear be silenced in the name of love all the time. You see anxiety get turned down in the name of God's peace all the time. You see people that are for you at your worst all the time. Awe came over everyone. All who believed were together. They had all things in common. It doesn't mean that they became uniformed. Everybody wasn't the same. These were, these were fishermen and these were Jews and these were Gentiles and everything was changing. It just meant that they were united on what mattered. The presence of God's spirit. Awe. A-W-E. Awe. I mean, I, I heard that and, and it caused me to pause to maybe ask you this big question today. Are you in awe of God regularly? Are you in awe of God? That, that the Almighty would, would want to know and relate to somebody like me and, and someone like you? That he would step into my broken story and yours? That he would do something in me though I was so undeserving? that we would see evidence of new life in me and all around us. And I wonder if so often we're forfeiting our awe because we step back out of community too frequently and settle for folks that aren't calling that awe out of us. That don't, that don't see the movement of God in and through us. And that's why I fear oftentimes we'll have these powerful moments with God but then we just try to go back to life as we knew it. Almost like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll see you again next Sunday, God. I'll tune back in when I get a chance. You know, you know I'm busy. We miss out on the awe of God.
And then we reach places in our faith journeys. If you're anything like me, where it's just like, man, what's next? What's missing? How, how is this? What's going on? What, like, is God still doing his thing? Did I miss all of this? Are you in awe of God regularly? And if not, I wonder if part of the reason is because of what we devote ourselves to. Because here's how Luke discovered this early church was operating. Verse 45, they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. And it says, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Like there's zero doubt that the Holy Spirit was at work. And church, make no mistake, he still is today. But I don't think he's gonna force any of us to be a part of it. And I wonder how often we are the hindrance to what God's wanting to do in the life of the one that you've been praying for, in the circumstance that you've been wrestling with, in the situation that's bringing you anxiety, creating such fear, that we're just trying to do it on our own instead of trying to do it like the early church did together. It brings us to a value that I think just jumps out of the page. This new community that God was birthing by the presence of his spirit, that because the spirit was doing a new work in people, the people were actively seeking a new community to experience that work together. And it produced this truth. We're better together. We are. I mean, consider that. How much better are we in sharing our stories and experiences with God than when we share them in settings of folks that want to hear it? How much stronger is the effort of sharing our resources when we do that together? How much more powerful is sharing our time and sharing our talents than when we do it with folks that the Spirit is also working through? I wonder if the reason we don't see a move of God in Pinellas County is because a move of God needs to start here first. I mean, if you think about it, it, it makes sense, right? Right? We're better at carrying each other's burdens than trying to do it by ourselves. We're better at loving each other and reminding each other of God's love when we're together than when we're apart. We're better when we weep with those who weep and laugh with those who laugh. We're better when we grieve when we can grieve with people than when we grieve in isolation. We're better when we understand God, his voice through his word and have people that say, man, I've experienced that. Let me tell you about it. We are better when we're not alone. And in a country that's facing an unprecedented loneliness pandemic, we, the church, followers of Jesus, should be the ones that say, ah, I found something that I think you'd love and that would light your heart on fire. And we know that it's true, but how quickly is it? Well, I would love to do that, but have you seen my calendar lately? I would love that, but I'm just so busy. I would love that, but I got to get the kids to their game and to their gymnastics and to their birthday party this weekend exactly the way the seven-year-old wants it because I don't want the pressure of facing that seven-year-old and having let her down. Sorry, that was a personal moment that I'm still working through just myself. Right? But we know that it's true. It's easier to buy a lie when we're alone. It's easier to quit when we're alone. It's easier to give in when we are alone. It's easier to misunderstand when we're alone. And every National Geographic show we've watched, the lion always goes for the one that got separated from the pack because he's alone. But how often do we as believers experience this new life in Jesus? And instead of fueling it with people that want to call it out of us and see it fan fully into flame, we just say, man, that was cool. Now back to life. And that flame that begins starts to grow dim because we're not around people that are fanning it into flame. I think, I think the early church would have been like, wait, you only get together with your church family for an hour a week? 
I, th- I think the church, the early church would have been like, wait, that's it? Is it harder sometimes to be with people in community? Yes, because you're gonna be in community with people like me, <laughs> imperfect, broken, just like you. But that's what God uses to grow us. And and I'm telling you, the people that I most consistently see that are seeing incredible growth in their faith journeys are the ones that are sharing stories about their groups or their serve teams or the impact they felt as they were on mission. It's about being together with the people of God and groups and classes and, and teams that make all of this happen. But how often am I most quickly to say, yeah, but I'm tired. I think God understands how busy I am. What's, I add another thing to my week? And all of those things are just examples of excuses. People that start experiencing a new thing that tend to flame out in their new thing never process the next step of community. Maybe it's some folks that you're sitting around right now Maybe it's time to join a team or to ask about a group or a class. Maybe it's time to be the one that say, you know what, I see you every Sunday at church and I figured it was time to say hello. The pastor told me to do it. (laughs) Because that's what this thing is supposed to be, not a destination that we come in and out of once or twice a month, but a gathering of people that become our people, our faith family. Are you gonna like them all? No, no but do we need each other? Yes. Why? Because that's how Almighty God made us, to be better together. I don't know about you, but there's part of me that's like, what if, what if it really is just that simple? What if it's really about prioritizing what's next and taking a step into it? No more excuses. No more giving up, no more taking the easy road, but saying, God, I want that Holy Spirit power. So let it start in me with this next conversation. And what if we discover that the presence of God working through us is exactly what we've been looking for in our quest to discover what's next? Would you pray with me? God, would you allow that to be true in us? to discover that your presence is real, that the power is worth it, that what we're longing for and searching for is not a to-do list, but a group of people to just be with. And God, as we work towards that, would you give us courage? It takes that for relationships. Would you stir something in us, cut us to the heart to, to refuse to settle? God, would you give us just enough movement and momentum to see that you're at work and behind this thing to do something new in and through us. And God, may Pinellas County see a difference in believers that are committed to living better together. Thank you, Jesus, that you are what unites us. And may your power and presence be what fuels us for a purpose that changes everything. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.